Good evening. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Marika Kutsia. She completed a BSc degree in Physical Sciences in 1984 at the former Ransa Afrikaanse Universiteit. While working as a teacher at John Orr Technical High School, she completed a BSc Honours degree in Computer Science at the University of South Africa. She left teaching to work in the IT industry where she worked for a large financial institution for five years as a software developer. From January 1993 to 2002, she was employed by the Technicon Witwasser's Rand, first as lecturer and later as head of department. During this time, she enrolled for an MSc degree in information security, which she completed in 2001 with distinction. In 2003, she received an award as the most promising junior researcher at the Technikon Witwatersrand. Marika enrolled for a PhD degree in 2003 at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Pretoria under the supervision of Prof. Jan Ielof. She was a recipient of a Scare Skills Scholarship from the NRF during this time. In 2005, she was appointed as lecturer in the Academy for Information Technology at the University of Johannesburg and in September 2006, she received her PhD degree with the title, A Model for Web Services Access Control Incorporating Trust. Mareka is an NRF rated uh, researcher and has co-authored more than 50 academic publications published in journals and presented at international and national conferences in, inform in information security. Her research interests include trust management, information security, service-oriented computing, and mobile and wireless security. She has supervised a number of postgraduate student projects to completion, and she obtained NRF research funding from the Tutuka project for a number of years, as well as incentive funding. She was the treasurer of IEEE Systems Man and Cybernetic Society, a, chapa, a chapter of the IEEE South Africa section from 2009 to 2012, and is a member of the IEEE Computer Society, ACM, and SAICSIT. She is on the organizing committee of Information Security for South Africa since 2009, an IEEE and IFIP supported conference, and have chaired sessions at many international conferences. She acts as a reviewer for accredited journals and peer reviewed conferences. She has collaborated with the SAP Research Office in Pretoria, where a number of her postgraduate students held internships. She was until recently a member of Working Group 1 of the Building International Cooperation for Trustworthy ICT project. Um, as a discipline-based expert, she has been invited to present sessions at many workshops and conferences. It's my pri privilege now to ask Professor Marika Kutsia to deliver her address. Good evening, um, the VC, Professor Rainsberg, um, Madam Dean, Professor Meyer, Professor Willie Fear, other members of the executive uh, membership and senior members of the um, management of the University of Johannesburg, other uh, staff members from the University of Johannesburg, um, welcome here. And also, I would like to take a brief moment also to thank uh, people that are very special to me. Ik wil baie graag nou graag vir die mense wat my rarig in die pad om hier uit te kom, baie ondersteun het. Um, baie dankie sê, ek krijg nie altyd die kans hier voor nie, maar vir Johan, baie dankie my skat, as het nie vir jou was nie, weet ek nie of ek hier sal gestaan het nie. Baie dankie dat jy my altyd ondersteun het en dat jy vir my gehelp het as dinge moeilik gegaan het per ty keer, maar ek waardeer het baie. <coughs> En my twee kinders, Jan en Marnus, baie dankie jylle vir jylle ondersteuning, dat jylle geduldig was met jylle maal per ty keer, en dat jylle hier saam met my is. En baie dankie ook dan vir my pa, en die lou wat ook vanavond hier is, baie dankie pa, vir alles wat jy altyd vir ons gegeet het, en dat jy vir ons geleer het, dat ons potentiaal ver kan wees, en dat ons moet reik na die sterre. En baie dankie vir Janneke en Jan wat ook hier is, En um, dan ook graag vir al my ander vriende, baie dankie jylle allemaal wat hier is. Um, ek, allemaal van jylle wat hier is, is vir my baie speciaal en ek waardeer dat jylle hier was, wat jylle vanavond hier is. And then also my colleagues in my department, thank you all for being here. You're a great team, I really enjoy working with you. And also Professor Ehlers, that is the head of our department. Right, what happens a lot is people ask me, what do I do? And then I say, I do research and trust. And I get very strange looks. And 
very often, you know, I don't really want to say, well, let me tell, let me explain to you what it's all about because it's a long story, and I just sort of, you know, sort of get past that topic. So what I now have is I have a lot of time to actually explain to everybody who knows me exactly what is trust. <laughs> And my kids always tell me, you, you should never, you must, whenever they ask me a question, they always say to me, keep it short, keep it short. <laughs> but now I have enough time to tell you what is trust. Now, trust is a very interesting topic. Put this thing on. Trust is a very human concept. Uh, I think we as humans have, a, if you start studying trust, then you start to become more aware of yourself and how your trust engine that you have in your brain works. We all, we all have a trust engine. And, um, you know, if you think about how amazing our brains are, we have the ability to, every single moment of the day, we process information, and information is stored, all in the subconscious mind. And in your brain, associations are made, and connections are created, and you're not aware of that. And one day, perhaps, you walk into an office and you see somebody just giving you a look. And you register that. And then you continue throughout the day and, and then you may notice another thing. Something, there's just something that you feel you are picking up on cues. Your trust engine is now kicking in. And your trust engine is now pulling out all that information that you've been keeping in your brain. And then one, something may happen, something that you didn't expect. And all of a sudden, you decide, I don't trust you anymore. Something that could have happened that would have led to that reaction. So that is how human trust works. And that is something that we, um, in computer science, you know, study. And this is what makes it such an interesting topic, is that for my research, I had to study sociology, psychology, cognitive sciences, you also find a lot of trust work going on in economical sciences and biology and so forth, where we are studying how people and how <coughs> entities interact and how they collaborate and how they basically, through trust, they protect themselves. So trust is something that has existed forever. If you, you can go and look at the Chinese proverbs, you can go and look at uh, what the Arabians have said, the Persians, and also people that come from the environment that we're quite aware of. If you, for example, look at what uh, Shakespeare said. Sorry. Shakespeare, I mean, he was actually very right. He said, love all and trust the few. And I think that's quite important, you know. Uh, and if you read a lot of these uh, proverbs that people have about trust, you'll find that they are very often about not trusting. So what that tells us about human nature is that in general, as people, we probably are disappointing each other a lot. But yeah, trust is something that is very commonly known by the general population. If I now turn to computer science, in computer science, trust has got a very specific definition. Um, you know, computer science is something, it's a science that has been, hasn't been there for uh, so many years. Um, and we look at the definitions that have been coming from the community. And there's quite a substantial number of definitions, like 60, 70 definitions on trust have been written over the past many years. But if I look at, for example, these two definitions that we see here, first of all, we have somebody called, uh, two people called McKnight and Giovanni, who said that what they know about trust is that it, the, it is, is about a willingness. I'm willing to depend on something, even though I very often know that there is danger. And that is something we always introduce into the concept of trust, is the concept of risk. There's always some risk that you're going to be taking if you are going to be following your action. So you may also know that there is a, f a relative feeling of security. So I know that if I stand here, I can trust this environment. I can trust this floor that I'm standing on. I trust the microphone is working now. I know that these things are here and I know that they are trusted. I have a, I have a relative feeling of of security because it's all very common to me. So that is something that whenever we want to implement trust, we need to say, is there a feeling of relative security? And also here they say that it is all about competence. Competence in what we know. Competence that this machine, my laptop is working, it is a well-known make and I know that it works. 
So these definitions have come, and what we also know about these definitions is these definitions are actually coming from a very specific group of people that have been doing work in trust over the past 50, 60 years or even more. They have come out with a very, they're looking at trust with a very specific worldview. They look at trust from their perspective of how they see their belief systems and their values, and that is how they've defined the trust. And it's very often defined in terms of competence and in terms of integrity and in terms of that sort of, you know, things that, that measure performance. That is how we measure trust. In computer science, we also say that this is essentially what we do when we do trust. We say that, that agents make trust-based decisions. Now, in computer science, we start and we say, let us see how we can implement software that can do things for us, and we call these things agents. They have the ability to act by themselves. And they make trust-based decisions based on computational trust algorithms and models that have been created from trust theories. And the focus is to make communities grow, social communities. So what we need to do in trust is we need to study trust theories, and that is what we have to do in detail to see how people think, how people act. That is what we want to try to mimic so that when our agents make decisions sometimes on our behalf, they make decisions with which we will be comfortable. Right, now first of all, let's see, I want to give you an a, a idea of how we as people think about trust. So I thought this was a very really nice story. I'm not too sure, everybody probably knows about the Trojan horse and the city of Troy. And this is, an, why I'm using this example, it's a very nice example that shows us how we all make trust decisions. And then I want to take this to today, when we are sitting in front of our computers, and I want to show you the similarities of how we make trust decisions. Now, the city of Troy was under attack from the Greeks for about 10 years. And these Greeks were very upset that they could not actually get the city to fall. And they talked to many people, and they then came up with a very complex attack. So the, the attack that they were going to make on the city was complex in nature. Um, the Greeks obviously didn't, uh, the Trojan uh, citizens of Troy did not, they, have, they had no, uh, weren't aware of it. They were behind their walls. They had a very strong perimeter. But basically what they did is they realized, and that is something that is really important in this attack, is that for the Trojans, the citizens of Troy, they knew that they had a reverence for horses. Horses were like gods to them. So they knew that if they, it's like a soft spot. They knew their soft spot was the, the idea that they had about horses. And so what they did is they then decided they were going to build a big wooden horse. This wooden horse was like a boat, and it would have carried about 30 to 40 people inside this boat. So then they, they, they created this elaborate attack where they put the best sol soldiers that they had into this horse. And what they then did is they left the horse outside of the city of Troy where their camp was. They had a large military camp there for many years. They burned down the camp, they left the horse, and they, they left. And so the, the people of Troy thought that, well, the war is over. So they just left there. And what they did here is they actually ensured that there was a sense of normality. That is a very important concept, that when you want to trust, there must be, you have to feel very normal. You must feel that you are quite safe. These the citizens of Troy then actually had to go out of their uh, city. They had to go towards the horse that was standing on the outside. And there they could then inspect the horse and they could then decide. They had enough time. And they could then decide what exactly do they want <coughs> to do with this horse. But, you know, this attack was very clever because it was playing on their um, soft spot, if I call it that. They really liked this horse a lot. They really thought that this was going to be a very good contribution in their uh, city. But what they actually had to do to get the horse inside of Troy is they had to break down the wall to get that horse inside. And this is exactly what the Greeks wanted. So they pulled the horse inside the city, they broke down the wall, and the horse was then inside. They actually had a number of countermeasures that they ignored. There was one of the uh, uh, priests that said to them that never ever trust any gift from a, from a Greek ever. Never trust them. But they then said to him, oh, what do you know? We're not going to listen to you. And then there was another priest, and she said she saw a prophecy 
that this horse was full of soldiers, but she also wasn't too good with her uh, prophecies apparently, so they didn't believe her either. And then there was a, a Helen, she was one of the um, you know, um, well-known ladies in the city, and she then went around the horse, and she walked around the horse, and she sang beautiful songs, because she thought if the soldiers inside the horse were there, then they would have reacted on her voice, but that didn't work. So all the countermeasures that there were in place were ignored. And then finally, the horse was in, obviously, we all know the story, at night, all the soldiers got out, they called the army that was sitting just behind the next hill, and they then broke down that city. They, they conquered it for the first time in 10 years. Now, what I would like to show you in this story is how trust works. Now, in those days, they had a lot of time to actually go through this process. So they had the time to process what they wanted to do, and they had all these countermeasures in place, but still, you know, um, they, they still were attacked. Bring this now to today, where you are sitting in front of your computer, and this happens to us every day. And this is how you should think about trust. You sit with your credit card, and now there I have Alice. Now, in our world, we always talk about Alice and Bob as our examples. There is Alice sitting at home. She has a really nice machine. She's sitting with her credit card, and she's now thinking about, should I actually go and do a transaction on the <coughs> Internet? Alice is confronted with a lot of information all the time that she has to process. But what Alice does not know is there is a guy called Bogachev. He is a Russian criminal, and he's very good. He's currently uh, has got an FBI. He's currently um, on, or at large. Three million American dollars the FBI put on his head, and he's somewhere in the Red Sea in Russia. And in Russia, he's sort of seen as a good guy. They like him there. But he's actually stolen about 100 million pounds from a lot of British uh, citizens. But what he is doing is, and this is now what we are not aware of every day, he's actually accumulated a botnet, uh, or he's using a botnet, and this botnet is called Cutwell. Now, this botnet has got one and a half to two million machines. Now, that could be your machine at home. Your machine at home could be part, it, we call them zombie machines. They've been uh, uh, compromised with some malware on the machine, and they then sit at home, and they could be part, and they are, what they are doing is they are sending out spam. They are actually, that, that uh, botnet is sending out 51 million Im messages per minute. So, so it's flooding the internet with all these messages. And what happens is that uh, Alice is all of a sudden getting one of those enticing messages on her computer that says to her, here is something that we can give to you, click on this link. And this is where Alice's trust engine has to now jump in. And this is where you have to be able to understand the risk of what is going on here. You have to be able to evaluate the countermeasures that you have. You have to evaluate the assurances that are in place. And then you must make a trust decision. Do I trust this technology? And this is a question I think that all of us are going to be faced with more and more on a daily basis. Those of you who are using, for example, Uber, when you take that application and you wait for that car, what are you trusting? Do you feel safe enough to 12 o'clock at night by yourself get into a strange car with a strange man? So, so, so we are going to be seeing this sort of question more and more on a daily basis. So basically what we now see is that the speed by which these attacks are happening is getting faster and faster. So we as, as general, and this is what my aim is of this talk, after this talk I would be happy if all of you have a much better understanding of what trust is and what you should be looking for when you are trusting technology and we are, when you are using technology. When you are in cyberspace, what do we look for in terms of trust? In terms of trust, we, what we normally would see is that we should have Alice, and Alice is now working on some platform. Now, it's also important to understand who Alice is. Alice is somebody who may understand technology. She reads a lot about technology. She knows what it is, and she, she's got a good feeling. So her sense of normality when she's w using technology is quite established. But what we, know, we need to know now is how does she trust when she goes on eBay and she wants to buy a product? How does she ensure and trust that what she's going to be asking is she will be getting. She has to understand those mechanisms, so we all, all of us here should. The foundation of trust is identity. I have to know, do I know who am I talking to? 
And we all know that we commonly use uh, uh, the SSL encryption protocol where we identify that we are currently working with the right server. And we all know that we should be looking for the HTTPS logo. So when Alice logs into her uh, banking site or eBay and she sees that at least she knows she's now working with the right environment. Then we take it a bit further and we say, I can now, as Alice is on the eBay website, she can now inspect the website and she can look for assurances. She can look for checks and, and uh, <coughs> labels that will show her that this organization has actually been checked and verified by organizations. And then there are things like credit card third parties in place that will ensure that she won't lose her money. Uh, there's laws and policies that she can read. And finally, she can look at the website and she can see there are guarantees that are available. And this is basically the foundation of trust that we can build today as people. If you sit in front of your machine and those things are in place, you can say, yes, I can sort of get a feeling, I have a sense of understanding that this website that I'm working with is a trusted website. If this is not in place, essentially we will not have uh, an e-commerce environment. And as we know today, e-commerce is actually driving a lot of the economy of many uh, places in the world. When we look at trust, we now have to ask ourselves, I've now given you a picture of just what trust is. You know, how do we actually build a bit of trust when we're on the internet? And I've said that trust is something, it's a decision, and it all depends on the risk that you're taking. But research has actually gone and it's actually uh, inspected trust in terms of what is, it, what is it made up of. And what we see about trust is it's made up of different layers. Trust is made up, first of all, of uh, uh, your basic uh, evidence that you are collecting and then it's made up of some emotion that comes into the play. And basically what we see is that we have a few constructs here that, uh, for example, those, uh, well, I'm going to discuss them on the next slide a little bit more. And then the last one is trusting beliefs, which is more an emotional thing. And these ones combined together is actually going to let you commit a trusting behavior. But now let's see how this works on the internet. How does this work? How do these constructs work together when somebody is on the internet? And now what I want to actually show you through this example here, um, we want to talk about actually who this person is that is on the internet, that is interacting with eBay, and we want to talk about the actual mechanisms that have been put in place and who's actually put them in place and for what reason. So what we see is that First of all, we have a situational decision to trust. Now, this is you as, a, as a, uh, a person that knows a place like eBay. You go to eBay and you have decided that you are going to buy a product. That is your situation. You already know. This is something that you trust. This is your trusting stance as a human being. You are comfortable with this, and this is what you are going to be doing. Then we have to look at what is your disposition as a person. Now, each and every one of us sitting here may have a different type of disposition. Some of us here don't take risks, and some of us here take too many risks. And that will be something that will be determined by your human nature and the experiences that you've had in your life and uh, situations that you've been in before. <coughs> so your disposition to trust will be affected by many things. But generally, if we now take the general person for which eBay has been designed. That person is somebody that does take risks, that doesn't mind trusting strangers very often, and then that also is somebody that when you show him eBay and he reads the rules, he sees all the guarantees, he sees all the play things that I've put in place, that person feels comfortable. So after starting off and, and looking at all of this, let's say, you now have a, a trust in your mind of about two out of 10. So I'm saying I've got a two out of 10, I'm ready to go, I'm now going to start transacting. And Alice is then going to start transacting with eBay. She's now gonna start interacting and what she will know that have been put there, it means that she has to understand them, she has to know about them. She sees all the laws and the policies and the guarantees and she's now going to buy a product. And what will happen is now the product will be delivered, she will get it, and she will do it again and again. And she will realize, and this is very important to Alice, that the performance of the system is very good. And her trust perception of eBay has now grown to perhaps eight out of 10. She believes that a eBay is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And um, and time, her benevolence, and that is your emotion. Now the emotion kicks in. 
And as you start to feel more comfortable and you enjoy what you are doing, you feel now, right, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with eBay. I have a sort of a emotional connection to this place because I've been there many times and my benevolence grows a lot. And that's only something that grows in time. And now by this time, Alice is now sitting at a, a, perhaps a 9 out of 10. She's really happy with what she's been getting on eBay. It could also be otherwise. It could be that the product did not come. It wasn't delivered. And then she's really upset about that. And it will probably drop to 2 or 3 out of 10. Now finally, now this is very important. Alice now has to decide what she thinks about this whole situation. And her opinion is actually now going to feed into the trust of the other people who are going to be using that system. Now Alice is also a certain type of person. She's very analytical. She comes from a certain uh, world view where people don't mind to criticize. So if she wants to criticize, she's going to do it. She's going to give eBay, if she, it's a, either good or bad, a 2 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10. She's going to write her feedback. She's going to be very open and frank about it. She's going to say what she feels. And this information is now going to be placed on the eBay website where uh, others are going to be reading it. And they are going to be using it to actually determine then or, or to, to create their own trust perception of what they think about <coughs> the eBay system. So this is how trust essentially would work in an e-commerce environment. And my focus is, is, is uh, tonight very um, f f uh, set on the e-commerce e type of environment. And that is how we build trust in uh, systems. But now the other question I would just briefly like to address is how do we build trust in strangers? Because Alice is now also on the eBay site and she's meeting different people that she's never met before. And it's interesting that these virtual platforms have fantastic benefits, but they also come with major disadvantages. And that is, how do we know who these people are that we are interacting with? People on Facebook, people on Twitter, all these platforms that we have. Because people can create themselves with any profile that they wish. You never know who they are. So we have to put things in place, mechanisms in place, so that we can understand how we should trust strangers. And what we basically now do is we, cook, we use indirect uh, trust. Where we are, when, we then say that if Alice, and this is basically here, if Alice trusts Bob and Bob trusts Charlie, then we can basically make a calculation here and then we can say that because you are a friend of a friend, like we do on Facebook, I have some level of trust in you. And this is then something that we can use in the computation of trust when we are looking at how we can actually get strangers to trust each other in some way. And for that purpose, we then look at social network analysis. Social network analysis, if you have a large group of people who are all linked to each other in some way, gives us the ability to determine who, where is our community, what does the community look like, how are people linked to each other? And those sort of structures that we see in that community, we can use then to predict and to determine trust. Right, and then we, I'm just going to briefly now say now, this is how, I'm just giving a, 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 an example of how we then can compute trust. Now, in computer science, we have many, many, over the <coughs> many years, from since 1994, the very first trust computational um, algorithm was written. And since then, there's a lot of work that has been going on on how can we compute trust between different parties. And the algorithm that I've looked at is now called peer trust. And this is where we have an environment where we have many peers that each are individually communicating with each other and there is no central controller in place. So each of these peers talk to each other and they then rate each other. So the peer trust algorithm um, is a specifically defined for a sort of an e-commerce environment where we are conducting transactions between peers. The focus of such an algorithm is then to determine performance. How good is the performance of another peer? So I will try to uh, find a specific service. Let's say I want to print a document. That is the, the service that I want to have performed. And I need to find somebody that is going to be doing this for me. And if I'm sitting in a place where I know nobody, I have to ask strangers. So what peer trust does for us, it helps us to determine who to ask. So initially, when everybody is new to this environment, there's going to be no level of trust. 
But now what we say is because we all have a certain worldview, we will say we're going to give each of us a certain level of trust. We're going to bootstrap some trust so that there can be some interaction that can be taking place. And then we will be starting to talk to those that are closest to us. That is commonly what we as people will do. And then when we will communicate, then we will, after we have an interaction, you print the document, the document has been printed well, I will then give you a rating. So I'm going to rate you. And I'm going to continue, and then each of these nodes are going to be building up a level of trust. But in this environment, there is always malicious nodes. Malicious nodes who are going to try to bring down or to, to not deliver the service it's supposed to. My algorithm has to have the ability to manage these malicious nodes so that the nodes do not collude, they don't work together, and so that the, the focus of this algorithm would be to ensure that the community grows. What we want is we want the community to grow so that we don't want small groups of people always sticking together. We want newcomers that come into the community to actually enjoy the benefits of the community and also become part of it. So the algorithm also has to take that into account. The algorithm will also uh, actually... Um, when, when, when somebody gives feedback into the community, in other words, they're a good participant in the community, they are giving <coughs> feedback about others, um, we will give those nodes more points than we would normally do for others. So the whole idea of this algorithm is to see what sort of interactions are happening <coughs> and so forth. But what we need to note is that this algorithm is based on performance and that every node is only looking out for the best personal gain. That is, and that is generally, when we are looking at how trust computation happens, generally that is what we see, is that each node is trying to see, and uh, trying to get the best utility for itself and trying to make the most gain from the environment that it possibly can get. So this is then what this algorithm is. And I would now just briefly, I just want to quickly show you a little simulation that a student of mine did, for, uh, we did the work together, on just so you can see how this community grows. Okay, what you see there is you see a community of 100 nodes. And out of these, these are the green nodes. They are the, 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 the you can call them the good ones. And in the, my community, there is a lot of red nodes. Those are the bad nodes. So the idea of the algorithm, and this is a standard algorithm, the idea of the algorithm is to say, how are the trusted interactions going to be happening between all these nodes so that in the end, what we want to achieve is want to get rid of the naughty nodes, the malicious ones, and we want this community to grow. We want to make sure that all other nodes have an opportunity to be part of this environment. So let's see what they do. I just want to see. I'm going to initially set it to be a little bit, a little bit slower. Okay, so you can see this is how the community starts to operate and how each of the nodes will then, in an ad hoc way, communicate with the others. And um, what you should note is then initially all their trust levels was out of one, it was 0.5. So they all had a, a baseline of trust with which I, they started. And what we now see is a whole community that is now growing. All the people, all the different nodes are participating and this really gives good results in terms of it's a really good uh, algorithm that ensures that everybody gets an opportunity and you can see the red nodes are sitting on the edges, they are sitting on the outside and they are, um, you see they are rejected, generally they should be rejected by the good nodes. And what we will also note is you can't really see it that well, but what you can see is um, that the nodes that are sort of more to the middle of that whole grouping, the community, they have higher trust levels and the nodes that are very often sitting on the edges they are lower trust levels. And these nodes have been uh, defined so that they are rated on performance. So they are uh, rated not just on being good or bad, but on good performance. So the ones that have a really good performance are the ones that will be more uh, welcomed and more used. They are the more trusted nodes. So what happens when a node is performing well, it gets a high trust level, and when recommendations are given between nodes about who should we should choose, the node that is chosen is the one that has the highest performance. So this is the peer, this is sort of how peer tr algorithms work, trust computation algorithms that simulate how a community of different people can, in an e-commerce environment, 
uh, grow and prosper. And that is the whole idea what we want to do is we want to help the community to grow and to prosper. Right. That was sort of background to what trust is. You now have an idea how we as people form trust. It all, it all is dependent <coughs> on risk. We know how trust works on the internet. And we know how we build trust from cognitive um, evidence. And also that later it becomes beliefs and emotions that play a role. And the idea is that we want to use trust to foster in a whole community. We want to foster uh, interoperation and community growth. So at some point in 2009 or so, on, I became involved with the SAP research office. Uh, and their focus, their focus of research was how can we build and use technology to support uh, very small enterprises in South Africa and especially mobile technology? And then what I also in that, and I think this is extremely relevant uh, for what we also see today, is then I found in the Mail and Guardian, and I still actually went to find it, it, you know, it was many years ago, but I still found that newspaper clip. And I thought this was very interesting. And what this newspaper clip basically said is that we know that in the communities where we have spaza shops, there is a lot of uh, opposition against um, these, uh, op these shops. Because generally it, it is found, I think, that they do quite well compared to the local shops. And what people then said is if you look at how, in this case, it was Somali Somali Somalians, what they do differently is they network together. They uh, form networks of, uh, of different shops and then they buy in bulk. So they would go and buy uh, goods in bulk and then they would come back and they would then sell it at a cheaper price. And there is, was a network of them that work together and that support each other. And locally, the spaza shops don't do that. They actually don't support each other. And there is a high level of distrust, actually, between those. And that sort of was some supporting uh, information that we got to the type of system that we then thought we perhaps could start uh, investigating. Something else that I found that I also thought was very interesting is that uh, I just found this recently, and this also illustrates the point really well. In Saudi Arabia, for example, you find that Facebook is extremely popular. But they have, if you look at, I want to show you here, um, Facebook, for example, uh, about 21% of the people in the country are all on Facebook. So something about Facebook they enjoy. But if you look at their e-commerce adoption, you'll see, I mean, it's like 1 or 2%. There is no level of e-commerce adoption, whereas if you think about the retailing that is going on in those countries, you can see that they spend a lot of money on retail, but they have no uh, liking for e-commerce at all. And apparently one of the main problems that they, do, they, they have there is trust. They don't trust uh, e-commerce systems. So this is a good example, and, and the question is why do Arabians trust Facebook? And what, what is it about Facebook that they enjoy? And if you think about who they are, they are people that enjoy uh, living in groups. And therefore, when they're on Facebook, they all can be in their groups, and they can be looking at each other, and they can sort of find something from that. So it's interesting to look at the adoption of technology, how people adopt it, and it's based on how do we trust it. Trust plays an extremely important role. And for us as, uh, as computer scientists, if we don't develop trust in our technology, it's never going to work. Just something totally uh, different that I could just uh, also relate is that um, when uh, the Korean Air Force started to fly their first planes, they found initially that two or three of the planes actually crashed. And they couldn't understand what was going on because they actually trained those pilot pilots very well. And then they looked at the black boxes, and what they then actually found is that when the crew was in the cockpit, uh, in Korea, there is a very high, we call it power distance, between the captain and the people below him. And when the um, lieutenants that were in the plane saw things were going wrong, they did not have the um, openness then to tell the captain, Captain, we have a problem, we must do something. They just kept quiet because of that, we call it power distance. So what they actually there now, this is something you ask yourself. So what do we do now? If there is no way we can actually rebuild that plane. We cannot change the technology. But what they then did is they actually retrained the pilots so that the pilots behaved in a different way. 
so that they had the, um, you know, they were taught then to when something is going wrong, immediately each, everyone tell each other, don't worry that the captain is the captain. And this is just another example of how when you design technology, it has to be designed so that it is usable by the people that are going to be using it. Right, so the idea then is how can we support very small enterprises such as um, spaza shops, for example. And the example that I have here is uh, very small enterprises where we, for example, find uh, plumbers and e electricians. And these plumbers and electricians, they're all um, doing their own small thing. They have their own small businesses. But sometimes you want to help them to collaborate. For example, a plumber may come to some job and he may find that, okay, I don't have the capacity to complete this by myself. I actually need other people today. And he must then have the ability to then quickly get hold of somebody who's going to assist him in this process. And even then sometimes buy goods in bulk and share the costs so that they can run their businesses in a cheaper way. So the problem that we have in these sorts of environments is who do we choose? If you are a newcomer in this environment and all that we provide you with is a cell phone. So you have your mobile phone. On your mobile phone, there is an application. And this application is all that you have. Everything that you will be doing will be from the phone. So you don't have a central third party who you can go to. There's nobody that's going to assist you. You are sort of on your own. And this is very similar to the situation I, I showed you with a peer trust algorithm where every node is now on his own and he has to find his way and he wants to become part of a community where he will be supported by people that are sitting in that community. And also, who do I ask for recommendations? So if I want to find who to ask, you know, who are the people that I should ask? And like I've mentioned, there is no central party involved. So we want to now build such a system for people that w are going to be needing this and we must make sure when we define the system, that the system is actually usable and it actually follows the belief systems and the values of the people that are going to be using it. And that then brought me to a really interesting topic, the topic of culture. Because if you want to build an application for a certain group of people, we have to ensure that those people understand it and they want it. Uh, in the case of uh, e-commerce, for example, in Saudi Arabia, Obviously, the way in which the systems are being built may not suit the belief systems and the values of them. So we need to build something that will do this for us. Now, what we can know about culture is culture is interesting. It's not in your DNA. You are not born with it. It is something that you learn. It all depends on where, who is your family and what do they teach you. What we're looking at is when we are looking at culture, um, it's something that you are born with. It's not something you, it's something that you get taught. So, um, according to uh, somebody called Hofstede, there was uh, um, a number of ways in which we are looking at culture, and especially the one that I would like to look at is the one about collectivism and individualism. Now, that all has to do with groupings. And what's interesting if you look um, and how people see each other, when you're individualist, what we say is that I am because I am the uh, uh, individual hero, I dream and I do. So I go forth in the world, I want my freedom, and I, I, I'm a critical person, I have an opinion. <coughs> uh, whereas, if I'm in a collectivist culture, I operate in a group. My group is extremely important to me, and one of the most important things to me is the concept of group harmony. And I would rather come second sometimes in certain situations than um, hinder the uh, group harmony that is in the group. The group harmony is extremely important to people. For example, in Japan, there is a saying, if the uh, needle sticks out, hit it in. So you don't want to stand out. You don't want to uh, hinder um, the harmony and the trust that is inside a group by perhaps voicing your opinion, by being critical and so forth. So when we're looking at how somebody like this is um, on eBay, they work on eBay in a very different way. So we need to accommodate that. Now, when these people uh, that come from different cultures are on eBay, we may find sometimes that something like risk is more difficult for them to, to actually take. They're more risk averse. They have something that we call a uh, high uncertainty uh, avoidance index. They don't like risk. They're scared of risk. And even if you give somebody perhaps a phone and a, a cell phone technology and you say, here's an application for your business, 
They may not want to go that way. They don't want to actually uh, use the technology because it is something that is strange. So what we find is that they have a basic, perhaps more of a distrust of strangers. That is a basic stance of people. And we find that they uh, have a, find a lot of benefit from group recommendations. Their group is very important to them. Um, when somebody gives them a phone that is a leader in a group, perhaps somebody that they trust, they would much rather use that application than if somebody gives it to them who is a stranger to them. When they then uh, use something like eBay, mechanisms like security will perhaps not be as relevant to them. But what would be far more important to them is how the group uh, perform, performs and how the group tells them how this whole system is going to be used. Um, when we are looking at trusting beliefs, again, something like performance is not that well received sometimes. It's also important, it's still important, but if the group as a whole decides this is not something that we want to do, they would rather go with the group even though they may sometimes feel this is something that they would have liked to do by themselves. And finally, when it comes to actually um, giving criticism, we find often that people don't feel comfortable to be too critical. They would rather be more vague in their opinions, and they would be very nice. They would say, yes, you know, but it wasn't too bad. We say that they have a feminine approach to, to um, the world, where um, they are more softer on things. They don't, uh, are not as critical, and you know, they don't feel that they have to have their opinion voiced. So when these people are on a rating system, on eBay, for example, you are not going to get the real opinion out of them. The channels through which they should rather operate would be very different to sitting on a feedback system where you give your opinion. They should rather go behind the scenes, have a consensus meeting, and then come up with an opinion that would be more uh, something geared towards group harmony. So what we see is that somebody that may come from a different culture, perhaps with a collectivist mindset, has a very different way of looking at the mechanisms that uh, we are using on the internet and some, like I mentioned, for example, Arabia is a country known to be more collectivist in nature. Groups are very important, so therefore they would perhaps behave in this way. Right, so basically then, when we are looking all at, at all our trusting beliefs that we have and our trusting uh, dispositions, culture plays an extremely important role in affecting how people behave. When you give people in a culture, the tools that have been designed from the perspective of another culture, things don't really work out that well. And what we see with the simulation <coughs> is that the collectivist groupings form very tight-knit groupings and that the strangers that want to come into the groupings, they can't because generally people in collectivist cultures prefer to just interact with their own group. They don't want to interact with others. So therefore, you form these very highly trusted networks, but no interaction, and therefore a community can't grow. A community stays stagnant, and they can't expand. And so this is where this research that we were busy with now comes in to say, how can we create technology so that we can allow people with a certain value system to still exert that type of uh, um, idea, but also see if we can help them to actually incorporate strangers so that a more trusted, larger community can grow that will prosper and that will have more economic benefit. So basically, we need to focus then on something called group harmony. We have to make sure that people must be comfortable with the tools that you give them. That they must be, un the, the whole idea is that the tool should not now select just the best performing other party, but also look at the connections that are sitting around you and first choose recommendations and services from those around you, but still accommodating uh, people from the outside and still pulling them in into your community. So what we're looking at is, we <coughs> call it bonding capital. We want to grow social capital. We call it group social capital. This is social capital that ensures that the resources inside a group can be utilized properly. And what we do is we say, when recommendations are made, don't just go on performance, but first of all, also look around you inside your in-group that is around you. And then if you can't find anything at all, then move to the out-group and the others that are sitting on the edge so that you can also pull them in. So we need to then look at, uh, we look at social network analysis techniques. 
where we try to identify through some uh, calculations in the network we identify where are my groups where are my leaders and where are my influential nodes these are the nodes <coughs> that generally that the uh, collectivist minded type of person would rather follow and would we feel more comfortable with using we have then a whole process that I'll just quickly go through it, that if I'm node A, this is just, I'll just show you how this works. And I have to now find a service. Again, I want to find a service that's going to print a document for me. Who do I ask? Now, in the individualist approach, we will now say, first of all, ask your direct friends. We all work like that. And from my list of direct friends, I'm going to choose the one that is the most performing. And this is exactly what anybody would be doing. Who, whether you are individualist or collectivist, this is what you'll be doing. So, so you'll be using that service. But if there is nobody like that, who do you now go to secondly? And this is now where we say, find the nodes that are part of my in-group. In other words, they must also be in my group. So I want to try and see if I can find services that are in my group. If I can't find them, then I'm going to find an influential node. These are nodes that are very well connected, that are going to be, uh, be a good flow of information in the whole structure of the network. So the process of now selecting nodes becomes slightly different when we are looking at a more collectivist approach. And by doing this, we'll see in the simulation, you'll then see that instead of forming a tightly clustered set of information, a group, a community, the community still has that approach. It still is clustering around the group. But there is an extension to the outside and also nodes from the outside are then incorporated. So the whole uh, simulation then shows good results where we see that uh, 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 the number of successful transactions, for example, is quite high. And the number of malicious nodes generally that are being chosen are very low because of the actual I trusted notes that are normally being used for recommendations. So in conclusion, then what I saw from the research that I was doing is that indeed trust is different for different people. And this is just the start of research on this topic. Uh, in the world generally, the approach is always taken that trust comes from a certain viewpoint and from a certain belief system. And people are only now starting to see how important it is to actually accommodate uh, the the background of the individual who is looking at a specific system. And obviously what we have to be very careful with is to, to label people. You know, we can't label anybody here as being so and so. Everybody sitting here, if I look at collectivist, individualist, have some of each of them in us to certain extents. And so we have to make sure as computer scientists that when we personalize, we are basically personalizing software and tools. We do it in the right way. And this is definitely something that the future will see more and more of, is personalizing more and more technology according to things like your personality, your effect, your emotions, your culture. There are so many of these things that will be playing a role as uh, technology becomes more pervasive in our lives. Uh, you know, it's going to be, become more intelligent to accommodate the person that is sitting behind either the phone or the desktop or the, or the cell phone. Thank you. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.